<laughs> so, um, these maps that we've been talking about, let me go back and review some of those and also give you another map uh, today uh, that might be helpful as well. Uh, let me start here. This is again is a Ken Wilbur kind of a map and it's looking at the four quadrants from which we kind of experience uh, anything. Uh, we can experience as a first person, I kind of experience. We can have a uh, we, a second person, relational we kind of experience. We can have an it kind of experience, which is objectifying something and, and studying it like in science. And an it is uh, more the systems then, the study of the systems, the larger, uh, not just the individual item, but the larger system that it exists within. And so this is also a way that many of these are, are ways that mystics will talk about their experience of God. And, and they can be very different kind of experiences. And what we've found is that, um, especially in the uh, Hebrew scriptures, but in a lot of Christian literature too, it's this kind of we um, um, experience of God, uh, uh, an I-thou, if you will. Um, the separation of us from God, but nevertheless a deep communion a deep relationship with God, so that's deity mysticism. Um, the I mysticism is much more than when that veil between us and the divine begins to become more and more transparent, and we realize that this is an aspect also of what in fact we are. And many of the uh, um, um, mystics also will, will look at that today. Um, and so it is a, uh, you know, realizing our participation in the uh, reality of, uh, of God or the reality of that greater transcendent aspect of our existence. Um, um, and then, but we can also talk about um, it. We can um, objectify um, and study different aspects of our experience, um, but also of uh, uh, where we see God present. So... Uh, and in approach, um, we find in the mystics that emphasize God being present in all of nature. And there's, you know, there's not that separation, but not just between us. You know, the divine in us is the divine being manifest in the creation. And that's also very much part of our tradition. And then also the it's to see God in a cosmic sense, a cosmic mysticism that see God sees God not just an individual plants and landscapes, but the whole big picture. Um, so that's one way of, uh, again, these are meant to help you um, when you read this stuff that can be very confusing and <laughs> kind of weird to kind of give you some maps to make sense of some of it. So the other one we talked about was this one that many people who study mysticism uh, separate theistic and monistic, which I would say relational and unitive. And what this simply is, is um, the theistic is the we, it's the I-thou, um, an idea of God that is separate, but nevertheless can be um, touched, can be have a relationship with, can be uh, communed with. So it's communion. And the monistic or unitive is much more that I kind of expression, which is rather than communion, proceeds to a sense or an experience of union with God. And that can either be a a union that is still maintains some separation, but is very intimate and very connected, um, nevertheless. But it can also be a union, in fact, where the, the I and the thou is, is, uh, disappears uh, altogether. All right. So last week we talked about um, mainly this uh, map here, which is, again, another Wilbur um, piece um, that talks about the stations of... Uh, if you will, of, of human consciousness. This is a developmental model, an evolution, an evolutional, which I call evolutional, evolutionary model um, that talks about how our consciousness shifts as individuals, but also as whole societies as well. And the point of this is you can read some of these mystics and realize the context from which they're speaking from, the, the, the consciousness not only of the individual mystic, but also the consciousness of their age and their culture and what they are speaking into as well. Um, so we talked about archaic being basically pre-conscious. Magic is like a, 
four-year-old that talks to trees. Mythic is like the Boy Scout who learns uh, uh, what the rules are and how to be the in-group. <laughs> Mythic membership is what this is, or traditional. Um, and uh, rational then is moving, uh, usually with kids when they're uh, in uh, middle school, uh, start to study uh, science and they begin to see a bigger picture and they begin to question some of the assumptions of the mythic uh, worldview. Pluralistic is rational but it's also recognizing that beyond rational it's not about explaining everything it's about the experience the phenomenon of different peoples and different expressions and respecting that large spectrum of, of human experience and human expression. And then beyond that is the integral which is the first one this is tier two what uh, that uh, Wilbur talks about it. This is at this level we recognize the importance of all of these and the validity of all of these. It's an integration of all of those mm -hmm. to recognize that they each have their place. And one, you know, rather than this, which tends to um, criticize this, and this that tends to criticize this, is recognizing that they all have their part in the evolutionary process. And beyond that are expressions of uh, more and more um, loss or redirecting of the ego self and realizing a deeper aspect of our consciousness um, that in some ways is trans-conscious. It's not just our individual consciousness, which is one of the ways that our tradition has often talked about soul, uh, the soul. And there's been a lot of criticism of the soul by these folks, <laughs> rational folks, but there's not a, they call it, you know, the ghost in the machine, and they have this big debate about is there a soul and, and anything like that. One of the ways our tradition talks about that is it's not about us having individual souls, but soul is a bigger thing that we, uh, the soul is not in us, we are in the soul. <laughs> and that ultimately that is not separate individual souls, that is one soul. So that's one way that, again, this kind of consciousness starts to talk about not a dualistic um, picture of ourselves in the world and of our world, but much more of a unitive kind of understanding. And there's all kinds of ways you can talk about that, that unitive approach. It can be in, sci in science, it can be systems, it can be the experience itself. I mean, there's, you know, there's not one way to talk about this unitive kind of uh, consciousness. And if you know, if you read Richard Rohr and folks like that, for them, that is really kind of the, the, the kernel of the nut. It is the, it, that non-dualistic, what our uh, tradition and our spirituality and our mysticism invites us to, is, an, is more and more of a non-dualistic view um, of reality. So we'll continue to talk about that as we move along. Another one we looked at was this kind of separation of uh, heaven and earth. And uh, some uh, forms of spirituality are... are are mostly ascending spirituality, which can lead to a kind of leave the earth behind and ascend to a higher plane. And what often comes along with that is unfortunately a deprecation of body and material and existence in the earth uh, in order to reach this higher, you know, higher realm of uh, thought and stuff like that. Um, but there is also a de descending aspect um, to um, in many spiritual uh, expressions, and that is returning again to recognize the earth itself and our bodily existence as in fact also an expression of the divine life and to honor that. And really in the Christian tradition, the idea of incarnation, when we talk about Jesus coming down, um, that is simply an, a descending imagery of God um, dwelling in and um, operating in a human bodily, material reality, that God is not apart from that. And if we extend that to an incarnation in all, which some of our mystics do, in all reality, then, we, then that's a descending kind of, that's reclaiming the earth and our body and uh, all of the things that that involves um, as something sacred, in fact. Um, so, we also talked last week about um, one of the mystics gave us a model, which is a a uh, common one in the Christian tradition, and we'll see this also continue to develop, the threefold way, this way that, that people are starting to talk about what is the path, what does it look like, what's the progression of our spiritual development, and they're starting to think about that. And so this threefold way is first purification, which is um, simply that faith, that self-surrender, 
uh, illumination, learning um, from our tradition, but it's not just knowledge, it is also gnosis, it's experience of God and learning from that experience of God. And then finally, union, which is associated with contemplation. And I gave you these two funny other words last week, cataphatic and apophatic. We started talking about our practice last week. Um, cataphatic is with, uh, with speech or with, uh, not words, with speech. And apophatic is without speech. So cataphatic forms of practice are ones where we, like we did, I invited you to do this week, you take maybe an image from scripture or an image from life or a story and you kind of imagine yourself in the story or you contemplate or you think about, meditate really is the right language in the Christian tradition, you meditate on that particular image. Um, the wounds of Christ is a popular one that develops in the Middle Ages and the bleeding heart of Christ is one that uh, develops in the uh, Middle Ages. Deep contemplation on that particular imagery. And apophatic is more to uh, empty ourselves of image and thought and uh, concept. So any questions about these? <laughs> pretty, pretty simple stuff. Pretty simple stuff, I think. <laughs> the point, yeah. I do have a question. Yeah. Um, As you've been going through this, it seems to me sometimes you're using the word spiritual mm -hmm. as equivalent to mystical. Mm -hmm. So um, is that the case, or is there a distinction between those two? Um, I think that is the case. Um, and, um, and again, I think that's another way of getting around this strange word, mysticism and mystics, that people are not used to using in a Christian context, but they're not used, used to using in a larger spiritual context either. You know, um, I, I'd love to hear somebody say, you know, I'm not religious, but I'm mystical. <laughs> 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 because it really is about that. <laughs> we'll get to this, but let me give you another map. Um, the other map is also a Wilbur map. And this is what he calls the states of consciousness. Are, which are not going to, to write. I'm going to go back to purple. The red has dried up. The mystical vision has dried up. <laughs> no. Uh, it's asceticism, ascetics, ascetics, whatever. Wow. We'll talk about that later. Um, <laughs> so here, um, and what these are are normal experiences of, of consciousness um, or experiences of consciousness, sometimes not so normal. Um, but they are different from these, these states, because these are orientations of our consciousness, how we make sense of our consciousness, how, what our consciousness tends to um, you know, orient itself to, the uh, kind of paradigm of our consciousness at that particular stage. These are experiences of consciousness that can happen to anybody, and some of them are quite normal, and some of them are not uh, that normal. So, gross is just the gross consciousness, or gross experience is our normal day in and day out kind of way of thinking. Uh, analyzing, um, it usually tends to be pretty dualistic. We want to, we name things as a way of learning, you know, <laughs> identifying things. Um, we separate our experiences from you know, the, that was really good and that was really bad and that kind of uh, normal consciousness. Um, the next is subtle. B. Subtle. And subtle consciousness can be compared to, um, to like a dream state. In a dream state, there's all kinds of imagery that um, is, we become conscious of. Um, Subtle consciousness often is not bound by the normal, you know, rules of uh, our experience. So, for instance, we dream that we are flying. <laughs> we, if we take that dream out of the sleep stage and try to do it, we're probably going to have problems. But this is subtle. This is imagery-filled, connected, rich uh, kind of consciousness. And you'll notice that some of these... Um, um, some of these mystical readings are a display of that kind of consciousness. Um, remember the Old Testament, or the Hebrew ones that we did from the uh, Old Testament. Um, 
you know, a burning bush, um, a chariot and spinning wheel <laughs> in the sky. Um, all this imagery, this, this, this uh, visionary kind of imagery, which is part of the mystical experience, is representing that kind of uh, a consciousness. You know, I did a, a vision quest several years ago, and we're it's the same people, the same uh, community that's we're doing our sacred day walk here um, in our community here in June. But I did one in the uh, deserts of uh, Southern California, and it's an interesting kind of experience because I'm pretty, you know, down to earth kind of guy and rationalistic kind of. You know, I like to understand things. But when you go on an experience like that where you're several days by yourself and you're in prayer and you're fasting and that whole thing, um, you do begin to start to talk to rocks and you do begin to see things happening in your app, you know, surroundings that you would never think of before. Um, you do, I mean, it's just an amazing thing, but it's a willingness to suspend your need for everything to make sense for a period of time and allow that. I could have resisted that and not had that same kind of experience. But it's a matter of allowing that and keeping it in the context of understanding this is a different kind of consciousness. This is not, um, this is, you know, this is not me on mushrooms. This is me on <laughs> an openness to an experience, um, which can be very transformative, um, can be an amazing experience. So, so that's what's so good. So another one is causal. And this again can, can be compared to sleep in the sense of the deep sleep. This is the deep emptiness um, that sometimes we experience uh, in spiritual or mystical um, experience where everything goes quiet, where everything um, almost disappears in a sense of um, that deep um, presence and that deep present to um, that deeper reality. And so a lot of the mystics and the people having these kind of experiences will talk about um, the great void. Um, they experienced a, a, a deep emptiness that was nevertheless um, full of God. <laughs> they talk about a darkness, a deep darkness that nevertheless was filled with light. <laughs> and it is that suspension kind of of our senses and our uh, thought process that allows us to uh, be in that place. And you know, I know people that have been, you know, they're out hiking and suddenly they come around and they see a, 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 a landscape that just completely overwhelms them. And they may sit down and they may be there for an hour without even realizing that the time has passed. You know, suspension of a sense of time and a sense of thought. And that is, that is a deeply human experience. <laughs> and I hope you hear that as mysticism, these mystical things that these people are describing are deeply human experiences that we are all capable of. It's not just these figures that we're reading. And when we talk about these particular people and read their readings, they are just a small part, even from that particular era, of people who are having these kinds of experiences and even writing about these experiences. This is supposed to be a sampling, not a, these are the mystics and these are the only ones. <laughs> People were having these kinds of experiences, um, and hallelujah, they still do. <laughs> the next one that Wilbur talks about um, is empty witness. And this is more of experience where that sense of self is suspended and what we find ourselves doing is rather than the regular engagement of our consciousness like here, or we might also say the regular engagement of our egos, um, we find ourselves in a state of consciousness where we are observing everything. We just see it arise. And we are the witness of the things that are arising in our experience. But that also th include, can include the things that are arising in our consciousness. So instead of our consciousness being one that immediately engages what our consciousness is giving us, we can actually witness what is emerging and rising in our consciousness. The um, centering prayer that we do um, on Wednesdays um, is one exercise in training us in that possibility of just being present and being the witness rather than the engager. 
And one of the ways that Father Keaton often describes that practice is, so you're sitting on a bank and you're watching the boats go by. It's not like the boats are going to disappear. <laughs> the boats are going to go by, <laughs> you know. But the point is you don't get on the boat. You just observe the boat. And as you practice yourself in that kind of uh, practice over time, you also are able, what happens is the boats that you don't normally allow to arise into your consciousness, they also show up. And the point is you're not going to get on that boat either, but you're able to see it now. You're able to observe that particular kind of thought and sense that you have. I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's what that is. So anyway, <laughs> the last one that Wilbur gives us is suchness. It sounds like a racehorse. It sounds like a what? A racehorse? Yeah. Suchness. <laughs> now, if I see a race paper today and it has suchness in there, I'm betting on that. Bet it all. Like I, yeah, like I do the horses. Um, <laughs> suchness is much more of a, uh, when even this drops out, where we are witnessing, and it is just simply a deep being in and being, realizing that what is emerging in our consciousness is it all. And we are just it. And we are all of it um, as well. So that's another, again, one of those unitive kind of experiences um, of um, no separation. And uh, so here's one of the things about this. Anybody on any of these levels, except for here, <laughs> can have one of these kinds of experiences. It's not something that you, I mean, there's practices you can do to help develop that, but it can also just come out of the blue and happen. And we find ourselves in that kind of consciousness. But the point is we will interpret that experience depending on where we are here. So if we are in a mythic, mythological kind of worldview, um, when we have a subtle experience suddenly, then what do we see? We see Jesus. <laughs> or we see Buddha, <laughs> depending on what our cultural... You know, we put it into the frame of, and we see it as something very real, um, rather than a, really a, an expression of our own consciousness. So we can have these kind of states. But as Doug said, he's not here this week, these can also be tremendously important to moving us ahead on this uh, kind of experience. They're like transition points that break open what we thought we knew <laughs> and the way that we thought we thought, and all of a sudden opens up a whole new vista for us. Yeah. The, the states that you just described, those are states that, that exist or occur when we're awake as compared to when we're sleeping. Yeah. Right? yeah. But Wilbur would say that these are the same, that the subtle mm -hmm. consciousness that we experience in sleep is subtle consciousness, period. Um, that, but we can also experience this in waking uh, mode as well. And I'm trying to think of the, um, there was another great author, uh, um, she wrote around the uh, early 20th century as well that talked about different kinds of states. You remember? It'll come to me. Anyway. There are several. Yeah, there are several, but there's one that's kind of famous, huh? But anyway, we'll talk about that another time. All right. So that's the map for this week, and I'm going to give you a couple of other as we move along. Any questions on any of this? Next Sunday we'll be watching a little bit uh, more of uh, uh, Roar's presentation of the history of, of uh, mystics, but we will also have discussion. Yeah. yeah. It seems for me that some of those are lacking, ah. and some are stronger than others. Mm -hmm. So are there, there's various practices to become aware of what state I'm in, to, to practice. Yeah. If, if, if um, like for example, causal, when you said, started talking about causal, I got, became very interested because those are the states of my, or states of being where I really feel most comfortable in myself, yeah. but rarely do. Yeah, yeah. You know, I've gone to so many different uh, kind of meditation classes and programs from so many different traditions and they are so similar <laughs> in the sense of what they're talking about and again the eastern model the eastern word for this or the word we typically hear is meditation uh, meditation in the christian tradition tradition speaks more about the cataphatic uh, 
The apophatic is talked about as contemplation, which is intended to be a deeper kind of um, experience. When we get to the modern mystics, we're going to be reading some of Thomas Merton, um, who talks a, a lot about contemplative consciousness um, and what that means and how we um, develop that or nurture that uh, at any rate. Um, <coughs> And causal is one of those. A lot of the meditative, especially the, the meditation that is not on an on a object, but a meditation that is ten, meant to empty, um, which is um, different uh, teachings have different approaches to that because it is difficult to get into. And then it's difficult to figure out why am I doing this, <laughs> you know, over long periods of time. I mean, Zen folks will sit and look at a wall for hours, you know, and sit in that uh, particular position. So what is that intended to do? And more and more the hope is in that that will lead into a, an experience that is uh, very much causal, uh, but also then will lead them um, to be able to do this. Um, and it's, um, it's interesting, and most of them also have in common that um, when we figure it out, it's not something like we've achieved awakening, no, we realized that we were always already awake. <laughs> we just didn't recognize it. Right. Didn't know what it was. Full circle. Yeah. It is a aspect of our consciousness, yeah. So do most, <clears throat> well, I would say mostly, I stay between gross and subtle. Hmm. And not, not a very highly developed state of consciousness. Hmm. Because sometimes with a subtle, I can go forward like in this half dream state, half reality as I go throughout my day, but then I go to a gross state where I try to define where am I at, what am I doing, mm -hmm. where do I need to be, mm -hmm. yeah. and it seems like I go between those two more than yeah. a developed state. I think, th I think that's actually very normal. Yes, that's, yes. That's not something that, that's an unusual, um, an, an unusual relationship to those experiences. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's unusual to have somebody who spends their entire waking life in an empty witness state. Uh -huh. that, those are those are really mystical kinds of people. You'll know them when you see them. You know, they're just I, yeah. Right. Am well, Thomas. Yeah. Watch? Well, Thomas Keating right now. Of course, he's approaching <laughs> the, the, the the end of his life, and um, he's done so much great work in teaching. But now he is just simply concentrating on this experience of of being present to that greater reality and he's talked about it he's so in love with that <laughs> kind of experience right now in his life and he has the freedom to do it yeah it seems like these things that we're talking about are passive hmm. and going through those stages it can create awareness but then awareness can create outrage and then oh, outrage yeah. can lead to action yeah. And so, are these, is, is, the, is this the end, or is this, I mean, is, where does this fit in that whole realm? <laughs> <laughs> is this the goal? Is this the, the end of the journey, or is this the beginning of the journey? Um, yeah. <laughs> Let me try to unwrap that just a little bit. Yeah. And you know, these readings are intended to catch a little bit of your interest, and they may not be doing that right now, but hopefully as we move along they will. Um, so somebody like Teresa of Avila talks about the interior castles of the soul, and she's talking about moving from one castle to the next castle. She is talking again about a process here. But in each one, each castle has its own um, dangers <laughs> and pitfalls too. Um, yes, the more we open up to, a, to that greater reality that is so often in contrast, um, at least socially and culturally, to much that we live within in our, in our time and in our culture, um, it can, um, well, first of all, it can scare the hell out of us. And second of all, it can truly disrupt um, our um, regular intercourse with the world in which we live. But it's also deeper than that. I think that there's parts of our inner being that has to work through this. Um, and we're going to see in our readings for today that the first one that begins to talk about the shadows, um, the shadows of our uh, psyche. Um, 
And so one aspect, and this is the way uh, Wilbur talks about it, in fact, one aspect is spiritual, and it is somewhat of a, um, um, what's the word you used? Uh, um, um, passive. Because it's, it, it's, it, it always comes as an experience of gift, <laughs> of amazing gift. But there is also one that is, um, is psychological, and it's very active, and we have to work through sometimes the, the stuff that, um, the spiritual experience, this kind of spiritual consciousness, then allows this stuff to emerge to our uh, uh, consciousness, our, our psychology, um, that we have mostly suppressed, or that we have mostly avoided. Um, and, and now we've got to deal with it, uh, because the, the, the gates aren't there anymore, you know? So that, that kind of thing is part of the experience, and all of them talk about that. And Teresa is amazing, because she talks about snakes and lizards and things that will bite you and and then you find you know you pretty much left them behind but then then you got to do this you know you got this problem in this particular uh passage and they all talk uh, like that um so we're going to see that more and more uh, as we go along the other part is that you know the buddhists describe it beautifully beginner's mind um Thich Nhat Hanh is has a whole thing about beginner's mind um where the more we get the more we develop in this possibility of consciousness, the more we realize we're still beginners. <laughs> that the master uh, is still a beginner in the sense of... St- and that's, that's not just about r- reality of consciousness. That's about attitude. It comes to recognizing... It, this, this is a very um, humbling process uh, because it is a process that is constantly challenging our ego, separate ego sense of self that we've created for ourselves. And it will complete, it, it starts to deconstruct that ego self. And that's another part of the, <laughs> the frightening part of it. And will we let that go? If we let that go, do we even exist? If Pat, as I think Pat is, begins to be deconstructed by my um, uh, different kind of consciousness, what happens to Pat? <laughs> you know, and is the is it the death of the ego, or is it the resurrection of the ego, the transformation of the ego to what in fact we more truly are, that still does not then negate the 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 uniqueness of our own experience, of our own life, of our own <clears throat> loves, and all those kind of things. But um, sometimes we got to let it die in order for it to be born again, resurrected. That's Christian language, but that's similar kind of language that we hear in other traditions as well. So let me talk a little bit about some of the uh, readings that we had in some of this period of time. We're talking about the first few hundred years, up to 500 years, you know, after the death of Christ, the birth of the Christian movement, and uh, some of the expressions there. Um, last week I was, I had it on my lesson last week, we didn't get to it, but it's, um, the emergence of what are called the desert fathers and mothers. Um, and so in the early centuries of the Christian movement, um, there is, um, there's persecution, there's difficulties, they're, they're not accepted within, um, the state. Um, Their religion is not accepted within the state. They are persecuted. Um, The the Jewish people also, their their nation has been destroyed. They've been dispersed all over the empire. Um, So very, very difficult times. And people begin to look for, um, and again, also because of their experience, they are finding themselves at odds with the kind of consciousness that is dominating um, their particular era and time in, um, in history. Um, so many of them flee to desert places or wilderness places, um, most notably in Egypt uh, because of the, you know, the climate and the river. And, I, you know, the, it's an easy place to go and, and uh, be separate from, uh, uh, from the world. And some of them went because they were fleeing persecution, and many of them went because they were seeking a deeper um, application of their spiritual life. And... Uh, this is the beginning of uh, monasticism in the tra- tra- uh, Christian tradition as well. Um, as some of these people gather in communities, 
Um, and, uh, and some of them, though, are hermits. Um, they are not in community. They are completely in isolation, and that's how they want to focus their attention um, in their religious or spiritual life. And, you know, it is a lot about uh, intention and attention. Um, what is my intention here? Um, it's not just uh, my intention is to be holy or my intention is to be a great mystic. <laughs> the intention really is something deeper in um, what it means to be human. And we may not even be able to put a name on that intention, but we are seeking something that is deeply human, um, an aspect of our reality and experience as human beings that we don't normally attend to because we're normally attending to survival, <laughs> right? Um, but this is a deeper aspect of our reality. So the intention then, that intention of being present to that, um, then leads one to ask, well, how can I attend to that? How can I be present to that? And what best serves my desire to, uh, to do that? Um, and part of that for many people was that they needed to separate themselves from normal society, um, either in community or, or alone. And a lot of it involved different kinds of uh, expressions of asceticism, um, which is basically um, the use of suffering for the sake of that, that attention, <laughs> of that being present to. Um, so asceticism becomes an aspect in the Christian tradition as a way of, um, of focusing attention and being present, uh, if you will. Um, another map piece, and I'll put it up next week, I'll just say it today. Um, Two ty types of, uh, of this. One is cenobitic. These wonderful Latin and Greek words. <laughs> cenobitic is uh, um, communities, people who wanted to do this, but they wanted to do it in community. And often they would have a community where they had separate dwellings, but they were still together and they would worship together and come together at different times. But a lot of time, their times were also spent in silence uh, as well. Um, I was an oblate with the uh, um, Camaldolese, uh community in uh, California, and an oblate is simply a, a lay supporter of the order, and one of my spiritual direction um, supervisors was one of the monks there, and I would go for a retreat there, and they would have, um, it would look like an Italian village, <laughs> you'd have these little <laughs> houses and streets and all, and they spent most of their time, though, um, in silence, but they could also choose to go up into the mountains in uh, individual huts and be hermits, that's really what the uh, Kamaldolese began as was hermits, and that is called eremitic, um, the eremitic form, which is, means hermit, um, persons that want to spend most of their time um, in solitude. And so we had a couple of readings here, um, Aminus the Hermit, let's see if I have those writings, yeah. Mm -hmm. I have shown you the power of silence, how thoroughly it heals and how fully pleasing it is to God. Wherefore, I have written to you to show yourself strong in this work that you have undertaken. Um, it was because of silence that the power of God dwelt in uh, the saints, because of silence that the mysteries of God were known to them. So again, this is about attention, attention to the, um, the presence. Um, and... Silence and solitude being a way to get down to that because you're not distracted by all the other things. Um, we also read from, by the way, we have, we have a great library here. And uh, in that library, you will find what we are reading next, The Wisdom of the Desert Fathers, which is a collection of short <laughs> sayings by um, the Desert Fathers and Mothers. And um, also, we talked about origin last week. Great book on origin back there. Um, Cassian, we're talking about this, um, this week, I think. And we have a great book on Cassian. And also the Confessions of St. Augustine. If you've never read the Confessions of St. Augustine, I would highly recommend it. So anyway, um, in this Wisdom of the Desert Father, we've got this strange piece about these people, you know, never sleeping in a bed, sitting at the door. <laughs> and, and again, it's a matter of attention. But what happens is there develops these kind of even excessive kind of forms of, uh, of asceticism. Um, like, for instance, people who will climb up a pole, you know, 20 feet off the ground and live on that pole for 20 years <laughs> at the top of that pole. You know, they'll, he'll drop a rope, they'll send up food to him, and he'll sit on that pole for, you know decades. Um, I mean, these amazing acts uh, of asceticism um, that could be uh, 
I'm a bit excessive. Um, so again, <laughs> kind of like Origen castrating himself, but... Holy, <laughs> holy. Yeah. So here is again that tension. Um, what if we're going to focus on this, this other kind of consciousness and this deeper experience, but what about our life in the world? <laughs> and what about the earth? And what about our bodies and all that kind of stuff? And it can often be left behind. Um, there was a, a trend within some uh, Gnostics, which were really several different religious kind of traditions um, around the time of Christ, um, to look at um, the earth and the body as evil in itself. Material existence is evil, period. And the idea was then to escape that. And they also were tend tended toward an ascetic kind of lifestyle then to not engage uh, earthly <coughs> life in any meaningful way. So... Um, John Cassian, um, let me get to where I am here, he was a Eremitic um, monk, he was a hermit, and he believed that the desert solitary alone, um, uh, only that best placed a person uh, to reach the heights of contemplation. And uh, that involved then continual acts of renunciation. Again, not to engage in the normal aspects of life in order to focus um, on God um, and an uninterrupted communion with God. Um, so he did express some extreme forms of uh, intention and intention. Um, but yet, at the same time, he expresses a deep love and intimacy that leads to a genuine sense of union with God. So he's talking about a unitive kind of experience with God. And you, sense, you see that especially at the end of the reading that we had, uh, had uh, over, the last few, uh, over the last week. He says, um, let's see. So that as he loves us with a pure and unfeigned and indissoluble love, so we also may be joined to him by a lasting and inseparable affection. Since we are so united to him, that whatever we breathe or think or speak is God. So again, this is a, an intense communion, intimacy with God that is leading more and more into a unitive kind of experience uh, of God that he is talking about. So anybody, uh, what do you think of, did you get to read any of these or did you, uh, maybe not, okay. <laughs> So Gregory of Nyssa was the second reading that we got, and Gregory is called as one of what is known as the Cappadocian Fathers. Um, it was him and his brother Basil, and also Gregory of Na Nazianzus. Um, Gregory of Nazianzus was a, um, a significant, significant figure in my uh, uh, doctoral uh, dissertation. Uh, but these were great theologians. Um, they helped formulate the early doctrine of the Trinity that was developing uh, in the third century of the church. But the funny thing about that was as, as meticulous as they was about that and systematic as they was, were about that, um, they also recognized very clearly, you hear it in their writings, that, that this is the best we can do in trying to describe God, but this is not God. Um, this is metaphor <laughs> for God. They were clear. That you can't, you know, as, as they were trying to, and it was very critical times because they had to give a, a doctrine of the Trinity because the church was moving into this need for certitude and this need to define things. And they said, okay, here's a definition. You know, it's as tight theologically as it could possibly be philosophically as well. But guess what? <laughs> That's not it. <laughs> it's a map. <laughs> it's not the terrain. It's not the thing itself. And all the ways that we try to name God, in fact, are exactly that. Um, but uh, Gregory um, was more of a, expressed more of the Cenobitic form of separation. Um, a Cenobium, in fact, is a, 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 a community of, of monks or, or hermits who want to live together. And he was part of that and part of the development of that uh, uh, movement. And one of his, uh, his readings here is from the a commentary on the Song of Songs. And we start to see this, again, this language of love. And even this language of intimacy and sexuality is an expression of the 
um, mystical experience with God. And we're going to see it again and again. Uh, so he's writing on the Song of Songs from the uh, Hebrew Scripture. And this is love and lover mysticism uh, that is developing. And he too, like Origen, talks about the wound of love. Um, which can mean several things. This is also um, similar to the shadows, I guess. Um, it can be a wounding that has to do with uh, a deep longing, because that's what they're talking about is a, a deep longing that they would say all human beings have a sense of this, a deep longing for the transcendent, for the real, um, and, and the, the dissatisfaction that we never completely get there. We never completely experience it. Um, it can also talk about that death of our former self, um, a shift in consciousness toward transcendence um, that can again be disturbing uh, uh, from the seen to the invisible, from explanation to the incomprehensible, um, from knowledge to gnosis, a different kind of knowing, from dualism to unity can, that can disrupt our our, our sense of uh, comfort uh, sometimes. So it's a wounding kind of love is uh, what's being expressed here. Um, so he talks about an ascending kind of spirituality, but he says it's not a simple journey from darkness to light. So he's the one that begins to talk about shadow and, and dealing with our shadows as part of this uh, spiritual process and, uh, and experience. Uh, the hidden aspects of our psyche um, that the spiritual, as, uh, the spiritual process tends to expose. Um, so a passage through dark, confusing um, elements of the spiritual journey. Um, and, but nevertheless, also talks about union, a unitive experience at the upper left-hand corner, um, an identity experience with God. Um, so he talks about the eye of the soul, a divine element within us capable of glimpsing the transcendent God that in fact is also is God. <laughs> so he talks about the kindred deity, a relationship between human nature and God nature, that there's an identity there. And again, that's the kind of language and a lot of times it can get you in trouble. <laughs> and there's, we'll, find, we'll see that more and more as we uh, go through. So let me just say a quick word about Augustine. Um, Augustine's amazing. You know, so far, and, and I kind of introduced it this way, these, these early mystics are talking in very um, um, philosophical type of language. They're not giving us a story about their own experience necessarily. You know, they're talking out of their own experience, but they're not saying, this is what happened to me. And Augustine breaks the mold. <laughs> he says, this is what happened to me. <laughs> and he talks about his transition that is not only a, uh, a, a transition of thought because he's moving from one religious expression to a, a different kind of religious expression and a change in lifestyle, but he's also talking about a, um, um, a deep transition in terms of his own uh, spiritual sense and his spiritual awakening, if you will, uh, in many ways. Uh, so it's an interesting story. It's, uh, it's got a lot of lust and violence and all kinds of other stuff in it, too, so it's really good. Um, <laughs> but Augustine was also a bishop, um, a bishop of uh, Hippo, uh, Carthage, uh, which is now um, um, Algeria, um, uh, that area of North Africa. And so he was a churchman, and he was a theologian. You know, we know him for his uh, idea of original sin, which often is... Um, you know, not necessarily greatly understood. Um, he was an advocate for the church and the role of the church in people's salvation, that people could only be saved through the um, agency of the church. But he also believed that every human soul has a direct access to God, that every human soul has something that gives them, that connects them, that makes it possible for them um, to have uh, this experience of God, direct access to God. And so he gives us a spiritual biography um, speaking and thinking from the first hand, uh, his first hand experience. Um, and you probably have heard this phrase, it's famous from the Confessions, it's very early in the Confessions. He says, You have made us for yourself, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. Um, that finds its way in a lot of different liturgies and <laughs> things like that, but it's a lovely quote as well. 
So he believed that there is in every human an inborn relationship with the divine, the ability of our consciousness to directly apprehend God, um, and that that greater reality, in fact, is already within us. <clears throat> so if you took any philosophy classes, you'll recognize that that's, uh, that's Plato as well. That is Platonic thought that, again, is being carried forward uh, in the life of the early church. And uh, Augustine is attempting to um, blend uh, Neoplatonism and, and Christian uh, theology. So any questions or comments on our experience? Um, probably in his 40s, 30s or 40s. You know, he writes about his younger life, and he was a philosopher, and he, he uh, had a concubine, if you will, or a mistress, or whatever you want to call from the, from the age, um, but he left, um, and a child. Um, so again, an, an, another one of those questions of how do you bring together the spiritual and the, and the, and the life in the world? Um, I, I think he was in his 30s or 40s at that particular time. Yeah. Anything else? Well, you said the word Cappadocian. Mm -hmm. And so we visited in Turkey a place called Cappadocia. Mm -hmm. And it was... Um, That's where they're from. Okay. Mm -hmm. Really interesting origins of Christianity there. Mm -hmm. So anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and yeah, I hope this I hope this study touches some of your own experiences in ways that will make you curious about reading some of these, some more about these folks. That's part of the intent here. I want to invite us to one quick practice before we leave. And um, I printed these out, but I, well, I didn't print it out. Um, this is a practice called Lectio Divina, which just simply means divine reading. And it's similar to what we did last week or what I invited you to do between the weeks in reading a story and putting yourself imaginatively in the story. This is usually more a shorter piece of scripture. And it's not about putting yourselves in the story or um, it's, it's about listening um, um, to the words uh, very carefully and letting those words, being present to um, what the words are expressing and letting those words sink in, spend a little bit of time with them. And then um, seeing what, uh, as we used to say in our spiritual direction class, see what sparkles or see what shines. You know, it may just be one phrase. It may be one word. You're not trying to figure out what the thing means. You're listening for what just somehow resonates um, for you for that minute of uh, reading that passage. It may also be what disturbs. Um, what in there is just jolts, <laughs> is a jolt. And just being with that and sitting with that for a while. So we're going to tell you, do three minutes. I'm going to read the passage once. I'm going to pass it to Teresa if you would read it once. And then if Teresa, you'd pass it to Lowry if you would read it once. And, and read it carefully. And it's just going to be a minute of, of silence with that. And then we'll see how that feels. So here is the passage. We have a few minutes for this. Once Jesus was asked by the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God was coming... And he answered, the kingdom of God is not something with things that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is. For in fact, the kingdom of God is within you. Just a minute of silent reflection on that. Once Jesus was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God was coming, and he answered, The kingdom of God is not coming with things that can be observed, nor will they say, Look, here it is, or there it is, for in fact the kingdom of God is within you. Once. Jesus was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God was coming. And he answered, The kingdom of God is not coming with things that can be observed. Nor will they say, Look, here it is, or there it is. For in fact, the kingdom of God is within you. 
that was a rather quick movement through it, <laughs> but I would invite you to this practice uh, in your own space. Um, sit and read it, um, and then for a few minutes, <coughs> just be with it, read it again, say it out loud. Sit with it for a few minutes, read it again, say it out loud. Sit with it for a few minutes, and see again what speaks to you. And the, the interesting thing about this is when you do this in a group, afterwards you would normally say, okay, what was your experience with that? What's shown for you? What troubled you? What was the experience like? And nobody can argue with your experience because <laughs> it's yours, and it's going to be different from mine. And that's the beauty of it. So I invite you to this. Uh, this is also a cataphatic form of practice, one that involves thought, concepts, words, we're trying to loosen that a little bit, you know, rather than just jumping in with concepts and stuff like that. It starts to it starts to loosen that process, but nevertheless, it's cataphatic, moving a little bit toward apophatic. So, any questions? The readings for this week are include Saint Francis, which is beautiful, um, um, Saint Bernard, um, and. Um, 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 we have our first female reading. Um, <laughs> I don't believe I can't. Uh, Hildegard of Bing Bingen. And with Hildegard, next week we'll be talking about some other female mystics that come from the same period of time. So this is early medieval, early Middle Ages uh, folks. Okay. Bless you. Help put take down the table, please.